Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Comerica, ticker CMA. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, this company is a bank. It has a market cap of $11 billion, enterprise value of $6 billion. Um, the enterprise value can be a little deceiving just because of how banks' balance sheet works. So we're going to stick to market cap. This is an $11 billion company. So business description. Operates through a commercial bank, retail bank, wealth management, and finance segments. Um, that pretty much just tells yourself it's formerly known as Detroit Bank Corporation and changed its name in 1982. Operates in Texas, California, Michigan, Arizona, Florida, Canada, and Mexico. So pretty diversified, um, pretty high beta, tends to be lower quality if you have a high beta like that, um, but we can see how that plays out. Now, this is a pretty normal curve for what you might see for banks. So it looks like they managed to stay profitable in 2009, which is quite significant. What that means is you have 20 straight years of profitability. It tends to be a sign of a high quality business when you can stay profitable for 20 straight years in a row. However, what you can see is it is very unpredictable simply on this return on equity chart. It tends to be all over the place. Um, Prior to the financial crisis, like a lot of banks, the numbers looked really, really strong. 12%, 13 14 16 17% in 2006, peaking in 2006. And they have never seen this return to what it was before. But what you see is really good returns all the way through 2007. Now, 2007, you're down to 13%. 2008, down to 3%. 2009, down to 0%. But they managed to barely retain profitability there. Now, they have recovered some since then, but you can look for a lot of the last decade, they have been below 10% return on equity, which tends to be my tipping point of what I'd consider acceptable. You need to be above 10% to be acceptable for me. Now, in 2018 and 2019, they started to hit numbers that I found really acceptable, 15%, 16%, and 15%. 14% in 2021. Those numbers are reasonable, but it's really hard to tell looking at this chart if what I should expect in the future is closer to these numbers, 7%, or if I should expect 15% plus numbers. 15% plus is very, very attractive. 7% is unattractive. So that's going to drive everything of what you think the future is for this bank drives what you should expect here. Now, one thing to think about is, of course, in 2018, 2019, that was, you know, when the Fed had been increasing interest rates. And of course, they're doing the same thing now. So if that is what led to their good returns, I can't do it without further analysis, then that could be very attractive. But of course, during a lot of this period, interest rates were near zero, and it looks like their returns were quite poor. So interest rates can have an impact on your expectations for the future. Now, what's interesting to me is your 10 year median returns have a return on equity of about 8%, return on assets about point nine percent um, which seems like it's a reasonable amount of leverage you tend to you know multiply return on assets by 10 tends to benchmark what you can expect for return on equity so they're not getting above a one percent return on assets which is a little poor for my expectation but they're still being priced at a price to book of 1.8 which is very surprising that's a very high price for a bank that can't even return a one percent return on assets if the return on assets was one and a half percent and the return on equity is 15 percent then you could justify a price to book of 1.8 but it's really hard to justify for a bank with these numbers the prices that we're seeing here so my first instinct is this bank is likely overvalued. And that's especially true when you look at the net income growth only of 1%, gross loan growth of 1%. Um, you do have earning asset and deposit growth of the 5%, but they're hardly growing their income. I mean, look, you started the decade at $1.7 billion in net interest income, and you end it at $1.8 billion in net interest, net interest income. You basically have gone nowhere. That's very poor. You don't want to see that in terms of the business. Um, and so I don't like what I'm seeing there. Now you have grown your EPS quite significantly. And so I'd have to understand what's going on here because your EPS has gone from $2.67 to $8.35. But it's been all over the place because it's not like you have some sustainable numbers. You did grow to 720 in 2018, 2019, but you dropped again to, you know, basically a 50% drop in 2020. These numbers are very hard for me to understand and they're very unpredictable. That unpredictability is a precise driver of what I would consider more of an average business. You're very cyclical on return on equity. You're unpredictable in your earnings. It's very hard to predict out the future. When you're buying a stock, you want to predict out 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. That's hard to do for a vast majority of businesses. 
The vast majority of businesses are average. What I'm seeing here is an average business, average bank, average business, nothing exceptional here. So I'm not very excited yet. We will see as we dive in a little bit more. But before we do, don't forget to like this video. You need to like my videos if you're enjoying my content. As you work through these videos, your likes tell the YouTube algorithm that you're enjoying it. In addition, subscribe. If you're enjoying these content, I'm uploading three to five videos every week. I'm trying to hit Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to ring the bell so you can be notified as I upload those new videos each and every week, going through every company in the S&P 500. Now let's see what we can find out on the income statement. So you do have some provision from credit losses, and this starts to tell you a little bit more. You can see some of these poor numbers um, for 2020 likely comes from this big provision for credit losses. The good number for 2021 comes from a reversal. So here you have basically COVID, and then you have reverse of COVID. So this is common. You see this a lot in some of the banks, and so that's going to reverse a lot of what you see here. Um, it does say that 2021 is worse, but it's not nearly as bad as it looks. And so instead of a 56% decline in interest, you're really seeing something like a 20 to 30, you know, maybe a 20% decline. And so that kind of reverses a little bit of what we're seeing. It also means that 2021 is not nearly as good as it says. And this company is even more overvalued than I would have thought beforehand. Now, why is EPS growing so quickly? It's because of buybacks. You basically bought back a third of your shares outstanding over the course of this decade. You started with 192 million Million shares, you're down to 137 million shares. That's a very strong improvement. And so you really like to see that there. Now onto the balance sheet. Again, balance sheets can be very hard to distinguish on this term, but you can clearly see their loans are not growing very quickly. They had $41 billion in loans at the beginning of the decade. They're ending the decade with $51 billion in loans. It's basically grown 20 something percent, you know, 2% a year. That's not very fast. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a poor growth in loans. And you'd really like to see better than that. Um, likewise, deposits have grown better. You've basically 50%, 60% growth in deposits. That's much better return. Um, those deposits are going to allow you to make more loans, but they're not making the loans. So it's really curious what's going on here. Um, cause potentially if they had the ability to make more loans, then they could get better returns, but it looks like they have too many deposits compared to the amount of loans that they're able to make. Cash flow. Let's see. Again, the cash flow is all over the place. You have some of those changes there. Um, makes it difficult to see. This basically doesn't require a lot of PP&E. Um, you can see that. But you do have stock-based compensation here. But again, it's low. Look at the difference here. You have 30, 40, 40 million in stock-based compensation, but 300 million in buybacks, a billion dollars in buybacks, 600 million dollars in buybacks. They're definitely buying back a substantial amount of stock in addition to paying out a dividend that has grown three to four X over the course of the decade. So I really like the capital allocation here, but it looks like on the asset side and the ability to make those loans, they're just not capitalizing as high as I would like. The capital allocation is great though. Um, but I would really like to see more loans. Maybe they haven't had found the ability to make good loans. Maybe the value, the prices have just been too low. The interest rates have been too low. It's hard to tell. Um, but for me, I would pass on this company. This company seems average, average company with a decent price, maybe slightly overvalued and pretty good capital allocation. When I buy a stock, I'd like to see all three. And right now I'm seeing one out of three, maybe one and a half out of three. That's not good enough for me. So I would pass on Comerica. Not going to go on my watch list. If you're enjoying this content, if you have found value from it, hit that like button. I need your likes on every video you watch to help me grow this channel. And if you'd like to be part of that, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell so you can get notified as I upload new videos. We're uploading new videos Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right now, trying to cover three stocks a week. And so if you want to see those stocks, you need to be subscribed. If you'd like to see all the ones I've done, I have probably a close to a hundred videos already covering companies in the S&P 500 in, this, in my playlist. And that playlist should be linked about now or soon up here. So, you know, be sure to click on that playlist. You can watch all the past videos I've done on S&P 500 companies. If you like this method of studying stocks, if you want to do this yourself, you need to use the quickf quickfs.net tool. You can sign up through my affiliate link in the show notes. That's the first link right at the top of the show notes. And you can tell them that Trey from DIY Investing sent you. And then it costs you nothing to sign up for free. You can get a free account. You can get a paid account, regardless of which account you sign up with. Just let them know that Trey sent you and I can get a commission from that. 
thank you for that. It doesn't cost you anything for me to get a commission, but um, just consider signing up through my link if you find value and if you'd like to study companies using quickfs.net. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.